All right, let's get right to breaking news at 5 out of Washington, where we've got multiple crashes on both sides of I-5 in the Kelso area. All northbound lanes are blocked right now by milepost 42. Some traffic is getting by on the shoulder, though. Troopers are investigating three to four crashes, one of which was deadly. And at least one other person was also hurt. Now, several semi-trucks, cars, a motorcycle also involved here right now. Troopers are pointing to bad weather that blew through just after 2 o'clock this afternoon. We're also following some developing news coming out of Clark County, where an SUV filled with teenagers spun off the road, rolled multiple times, and crashed along the shore of Salmon Creek. The fire department says it is a miracle no one died. Wow, officials say the vehicle crashed around 1 this afternoon along Northeast 117th Street. This video into us from Clark County Fire. Now, a witness says the SUV appear to be going about 70 in the moments before that rollover and they add that nine teenagers from Brush Prairie High School were in that vehicle. Six of them were taken to the hospital. Three others refused treatment. The sheriff's office is now investigating and looking into possible charges. We'll keep you updated as we learn more. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter and I'm David Molko. Our other big story at five that ballot blunder in Clackamas County. Yes, we are still talking about thousands of outstanding ballots with blurry barcodes and have some big questions tonight about progress. County employees have been reassigned to help elections workers sort through all those ballots by hand. Our Mike Benner joins us now with continuing coverage of his story, including Mike, some new information just into the newsroom. Yeah, Laurel, we just heard from state representative Janelle Bynum. She's a Democrat out of Clackamas. Bynum is calling for a legislative inquiry to be opened into what she calls inaction by Clackamas County Clerk Sherry Hall. I spent some time at the Clackamas County Elections Building today, and I can tell you Hall appeared to be stressed and frustrated by our presence. And that's rather bizarre because what's happening in Clackamas County today and in the days ahead, as you're about to see, is a process open to the public. My vote is important to me. I don't trust it anymore. Tina Olson is spending her Thursday at Clackamas County Elections, watching a room full of people process ballots. It's sad that we have to come down there every single cycle. Olson is concerned about the thousands of bad ballots distributed to Clackamas County voters. The ballots were printed with barcodes that were either too light or too blurry, making it difficult, if not impossible, for elections machines to read. This is a drastic mistake. We understand the frustration. Clackamas County spokesperson Kimberly Dinwiddie says hundreds of county employees have been reassigned to fix the problem. They're teaming up with elections workers to process the ballots by hand. We're told up to 80 people can do this at a time. But first, their date of birth and party affiliation need to be verified in the voter registration database. Then, people of opposite parties need to be paired up. It's not as simple as names on a spreadsheet. It's a process that takes a bit of time, and so we're still filling the schedule. All right, so due to this ballot snafu, the county has had to come up with some special accommodations. This room here in the coming days will serve as an overflow ballot processing area. You'll notice over here some tents outside. These tents are for people uh, from the community who want to observe. They'll be able to stay dry. And of course, there are some added security. So there are some new cameras in this hallway here, keeping an eye on everything. We understand people want results and they want things done right. Tina Olson sure does. The Wilsonville resident pledges to observe the process every single day until the job is complete. My vote counts. All right, there's no timeline for when this whole thing will be wrapped up, but later this evening we should get an update on how many ballots have been processed up to this point. We can tell you all of them have to be processed and this election certified no later than June 13th. David? A lot of questions, but we should mention none of them at this point about the integrity of that vote. Mike Benner, thank you for that. All right, let's take flip you to Multnomah County now and update you there. Officials say they have about 25,000 ballots left to count. Most of those we understand are going to be counted today, but there are more inbound, officials say, because of that change this year where ballots could be mailed as late as Election Day. So for the candidates looking to unseat Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, Renee Gonzalez holds a slight lead over Vadim Wazirski. One of them will face Hardesty in a runoff in November.
Voters have made their decisions in the primary race for Oregon governor, and now the three remaining candidates, all women, are competing for the state's top spot. Today, we got a chance to speak with all of them. Tim Gordon joins us now here in the studio. And Tim, you heard from the Republican candidate, Christine Drazen, today. Laurel, we did. We certainly did. And Drazen knows she's got her work cut out for her to win this race, but she believes Oregon is ready for a change. Now, Drazen held her first news conference of the general election campaign at a small office in Canby. She talked about the need for a better way to handle the drug addiction and homeless crisis in the state. The Republican said as governor, she would declare a statewide emergency and get leaders to work together to help more of those who were addicted to opioids and other drugs. She says that help would extend to the homeless, but she would also make it less comfortable, as she put it, for those people living on the streets. The truth of it for our communities is that that option to just say it's possible for me to choose to live on the street and and take as much fentanyl as I can get in a day, that's not healthy for them. It's not healthy for our communities. Now, Drazen came out the winner in a crowded field of Republicans in the primary, 19 in all. She won with about 23% of the vote at last check. So Laurel Drazen knows she has her work cut out for it to unite Republicans and needing to get some others on board too to win, of course, in Blue Oregon, right? She does have her work cut out, but our political experts say she is a skilled lawmaker for, for sure. sure. Thank yep. you, Tim. You bet. All right, today on the Democratic side, the nominee for Oregon Governor Tina Kotek was in Southeast Portland where she toured a new treatment and recovery center. Now, it is a site that ties directly into the change she says she is hoping to accomplish if elected when it comes to tackling the state's addiction crisis. Now, in an exclusive interview with KGW, she talked about her plan to help those living on the streets struggling with mental health. It's unacceptable that anyone's living on the street. That's not how we want our state to be, and it's going to take a variety of solutions. But I have a plan that says on the first 10 minutes of my administration, we know what we're going to do. We got to get more people working. Within and look who's sitting next to her. So much more from that interview, plus the endorsement Kotech picked up today from Nor former New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristoff that is coming up tonight at and, six uh, on the story. Betsy Johnson, who's running without a political party for governor, picked up two high-profile endorsements today. Former Democratic Governor Ted Kulingoski and former Republican U.S. Senator Gordon Smith are backing Johnson this November. Our Evan Watson spoke with her today. Evan, what's she saying? Betsy Johnson tells me she hopes these endorsements show voters it's okay to step out of, quote, rigid partisan polarization. Johnson, a longtime member of the Oregon State Senate as a Democrat, is not affiliated with any political party in her run for governor this fall. In a joint statement today, Kulingoski and Smith said, we have both worked with Betsy and we know she has the courage, the common sense and the ability to find common ground needed to get Oregon moving in the right direction. They listed the homeless crisis, improving education and an urban rural divide as big problems that need solutions. These are stewards of Oregon and the fact that they would come together and one of them say I'm a I'm a dedicated D the other say I'm a dedicated R but we're putting our partisanship aside in the interest of our state just means the world to me and that's the whole thesis of our campaign we are trying to bring Oregonians together I asked Johnson how she would uh, how, how she would go about uniting the partisanship with this incoming elected governor. She told me there's never been a game neutrally refereed by one of the players describing the governor's role as one of a convener with an open mind looking for consensus. David? It is going to get interesting as we approach November. Evan, thank you for that. All right, election results now, by the way, still coming in and maybe as we have heard for days, if not weeks. So for the latest tallies and projections, just head to KGW.com slash elections. Well, this evening, a documentary entitled One Day will debut right here on KGW. Our team of journalists spent 24 hours capturing the street level response to Portland's homeless crisis, meeting people who are suffering and, of course, those wanting to help. So Kyle Avoshi joins us now. And Kyle, I just finished watching it. I felt myself grappling with feelings of, of despair here, but really also hope. We really wanted to provide people some perspective here and help them understand how this crisis mm -hmm. unfolds day in and day out. To do so, we take you places you normally don't go, inside tents, shelters, RVs, a fire station, a hospital emergency room. Our crew spread out all across the community, capturing one day. 
what life is like for those experiencing homelessness and those providing them support. It's exhausting, it's overwhelming, it's frankly unsustainable. Many of the stories we found focused on individuals. For example, one woman we met in a shelter with her dog. She sleeps there at night, but during the day, she works at Rite Aid. It shows the complexity of this issue and how many of us maybe misperceive homelessness. Often, these are people we're interacting with every day and don't realize the struggle they're dealing with. Keep in mind, there's also plenty of frustration in the community. Frustration about trash, drug use, concerns about safety. We get into that. It's a complicated issue. And again, this is just one day we're talking about. Just one day. And tell us a little bit about how this came together, because I imagine a lot of planning went into the process. But at some point here, you were just essentially along for the ride. Right. right. It was tricky from yeah. a production standpoint. A lot of times, you know, when we shoot stories, we find a great moment or we start out some amazing video. In this case, it was chronological. We were documenting 24 hours. So the first thing we saw in the morning is where we started and the last thing at night, that's where we ended. Uh, plus, there were some unexpected challenges like President Biden's visit. It just happened to be the day we had selected to shoot the documentary. And obviously, it's not something we could ignore. You know, one of many powerful moments that we saw there really are thanks to you and the team for putting this together. A lot of work went into that, so looking forward to it. All right, and you can watch, of course, one day responding to Portland's homeless crisis in its entirety. That is tonight at 7, right after the news at 630, only here on KGW.